श्रेया फ्रॉम कच्छ गुजरात लखनऊ बानो फ्रॉम लखनऊ यस सर जय यू कैन स्टार्ट थैंक यू थैंक यू सो गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन वेलकम एवरीवन वंस अगेन सो स्टार्ट विद द इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ स्पीकर इन इंटरेस्ट ऑफ टाइम टुडे आवर डिस्टिंग्विश्ड गेस्ट स्पीकर इज डॉक्टर सरिता महाजनी Ma'am has done her B.Sc. Microbiology from University of Pune, her M.Sc. from Shivaji University, and Ph.D. Microbiology from Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar University. Ma'am's current position is Principal Consultant and Scientist at Chitale Dairy Maharashtra, and she is also working as a consultant with a local one of the local ladies in Ontario, Canada. Ma'am has served 24 years in University of Mumbai as a lecturer and a professor, and out of which eight years she has served as HOD in Biotechnology Department. Afterwards, Ma'am has joined University of Pune, where she stayed as an HOD for Biotechnology Department for five years. Ma'am has also served as a principal in Lok Mangal Biotech College in Solapur, Maharashtra. other than that ma'am has also been associated with singer college of engineering and ssp university of pune as a visiting professor and as a assistant professor ma'am has also served as a consultant at amphinol interconnect pune and other than that i would like to add there is long list of publications international research papers and international presentations Ma'am has also served as a judge for various poster presentation competitions worldwide, and Ma'am is currently on board peer reviewer of respected Alzheimer publications, and Ma'am is also advisory board member of International Journal of Biotech Applications. Ma'am has also been associated with different scientific organizations as a life member. So in short, we have some. a distinguished speaker with more than 4 decades of rich experience and on behalf of dr silpa jani msi state president i would like to welcome everyone today because of covid she is not here we wish her speedy recovery and now i would like to welcome today's speaker dr sarita mahajani hello good evening to all of you good evening once again yeah once again um, i would like to thank jay for an elaborate uh, introduction i would like to thank the president honorable dr deshmukh sir and the microbiology society all the organizers for giving me this opportunity it's a pleasure to be here once again we started this series talking on the big trends in biotechnology and most of the ongoing advanced techniques so vaccinology and vaccine candidates the technologies used in the industries was the main aim of the first two lectures of the series so we finished with the industries the key features of the vaccines the industries itself the introduction of it and we talked about um, global initiative uh, program called as uh, covax uh, which uh, ensures um, vaccine equity and vaccine to all the poor countries we also touched upon resources providing new variant uh, sequences and that is mutation a tracker and a recovery awareness tracker long hauler tracker so the introductory part we finished in the last uh, lecture in the series today we are going through proper approaches and methods biological science behind developing these vaccines since the origin of modern vaccination in 1796 with the discovery of smallpox vaccine there have been numerous technological advances and breakthroughs in the fight against infectious diseases however most successful vaccines have been developed using conventional methods that follow the concepts established by louis pasteur over a century ago namely isolate activate and inject the disease causing microorganism that was the theory which was followed for so many years and it's still being followed hence most vaccine consists of either whole microorganisms either killed or live attenuated or purified subunits of the microorganism 
only a small number are based on recombinantly produced antigens. One of the critical issues that had emerged was the understanding of the role of structure-based vaccine design, which originated actually when scientists working with HIV, but did not uh, get its maturity with the successful vaccine as yet. Trying to get the right confirmation of the molecule to allow to be able to induce neutralizing antibodies has not yet come into uh, being in case of HIV. But it was this practice of structure-based vaccine design which allowed the NIH, <clears throat> particularly Dr. Graham, Deputy Director, uh, Vaccine Research Center, Maryland, and his colleagues to actually develop an immunogen in the form of a spike protein which is used now in most of the vaccines. It is an extraordinary testimony to the fundamental of basic sciences that are uh, antedated to the development. And so we start this series, or we start this particular lecture in this uh, series, the second lecture, by seeing all the uh, companies and all the vaccines and, and the platforms that they have built the vaccines on. Uh, to, to make a note, uh, all the links of the references uh, for each of the slide uh, is given at, at the end of each of the slide in my presentation. So we start with, being a microbiologist, we often learn to define microorganism first. Whenever we come across any microorganism, we want to study it. The first thing that we do is define it. So SARS-CoV-2 uh, belongs to a beta coronavirus of the family, coronaviridae. They have enveloped virions that measure about 120 nanometers in, di in diameter. They are club-shaped glycoprotein spikes in the envelope that are embedded in the envelope. Uh, and it gives the virus a crown or coronial appearance. That's why they are called as coronavirus. The nucleocapsid is made up of a protein shell known as a capsid and containing the virus called as nucleic acids called as RNA. So it's helical in structure. The coronavirus genome consists of a single strand of positive strand RNA. The disease it causes commonly induces respiratory symptoms such as fever, unproductive cough, myalgia, muscle pain, fatigue. The virus spreads easily among people exposed to small droplets or aerosols that stay in the air for several minutes or hours. That's why it is called as airborne transmission. A pneumonia of unknown cause was detected in Wuhan, in China, reported in 2019. On 8th of January, the pathogen caused outbreak and was identified as a novel coronavirus 2019. The outbreak was declared as a public health emergency for international concerns on 30th January. On 12th February, the virus was officially named as SARS-CoV-2 and uh, WHO officially named the disease as COVID. On 11th March, the WHO up upgraded the status of the corona uh, of COVID-19 outbreak from epidemic to pandemic, which spread globally at high speed. So its remarkable ability to transmit uh, through the human population, the lethal effects that it caused, and uh, nothing short of isolation has been successful in stopping the global spread. And this brought to all the rush in the therapies, antiviral drugs, non-pharmacological methods to treat it. Uh, and since its discovery last year, one of the biggest concerns had always been identifying a vaccine to stop this virus with rapid development uh, of the effective vaccine. And uh, importantly, uh, modern society benefits from the wealth of technology that can be utilized to improve and assist in the search of a, for a cure. So biotechnology plays a key role in the discovery and development of all the tests, therapies, and um, all the vaccines that they are produced. So it's an RNA virus. Let us go to what was the scientist interested in. SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. That means that unlike in human and other mammals, the genetic material of, of SARS-CoV-2 is encoded in a ribonucleic acid, that is RNA. The viral RNA is sneaky. That means its features causes the protein synthesis machinery in the human being to mistake it for the RNA produced by our own DNA. So SARS-CoV-2 genome encodes instruction organized into sections called genes to build the virus. And an RNA 
metagenomic next generation sequencing approach uh, has had been applied has been applied to characterized its entire its entire genome which is about um, 29881 you can see in the diagram there in the picture there uh, base pairs in length encoding about um, 9860 amino acids the gene frag uh, fragments express structural and non structural proteins if you go from the left hand side that is the initial strand you will find that uh, they they start from the open reading frame coding main proteases then rna dependent rna polymerase nucleocapsid and uh, then the four uh, structural proteins namely spike s protein spike envelope protein e membrane protein m and nucleocapsid n so this is the structure of the genomic uh, structure of the virus the s protein plays a crucial role here in uh, revoking or provoking the um, immune response during the disease progression so in the figure here or the picture here it the, it shows that the genes in the sars cov2 genome that contain instructions to build parts of the virus which are shown in different colors for example the brown color in the picture on the top and the dark green color the below picture has uh, genetic information or instruction to build the spike proteins and the, and the scientists are interested only in that particular part which allows the virus to attach to the human cells during infection this section of the genome serves as a key region for monitoring mutations also that has to be noted so a molecular model you can see on the left hand side which shows the spikes red color bound to the angiotensin converting enzymes too that is ace2 receptors which is blue in color on the human cell once inside the cell the virus uses the cell's machinery to make more copies of itself so in short as we are going to go further we are going to see that how these spike proteins were brought into use by all the scientists so coming to the basic one or two slides i would like to just brush off on vaccine as as we are learning our technology we are studying technology now so let us see vaccines how they are made up or what are the ingredients of the vaccine the vaccine contains tiny fragments of disease causing microorganism most important or the blueprints for making tiny fragments they also contain other ingredients to keep the vaccine safe and effective each vaccine component serves a specific purpose and each ingredient is tested in the manufacturing process all vaccines contain an active component called as antigen we generate an immune response or the blueprint making the active component okay the antigen may be a small part of the organism like a protein or a sugar or the whole organism weakened or in active form next is the preservative which prevents the vaccine from becoming contaminate contamination uh, once the vial has been opened if it is a single dose there is there is no need to have a preservative in it so there are stabilizers in it which prevent chemical reactions from occurring within the vaccine and keep the vaccine components from sticking to the vaccine vial so there are surfactants in it keep, which keep all the ingredients in the vaccine uh, blended together they prevent settling and clumping of the elements uh, that are in the liquid form of the vaccine so then there are um diluents a diluent is a liquid used to dilute a vaccine in the correct concentration prior to the use and uh, most most importantly always the diluent is sterile water then there are adjuvants which are added in some vaccines which contain uh, which improves the immune response which triggers the immune response you can say um and then there are they can, this, these adjuvants can be ammonium salts or ammonium hydroxide potassium ammonium hydroxide or sulfate and uh, here as i say each ingredient in the vaccine serves its specific purpose specific purpose and provide immunity protection and keep the vaccine safer for longer time so coming to the basics of three approaches that are used in designing a vaccine we we'll just see the definitions here um, the, these differences lie in whether they use a whole virus or bacterium or they use just part of the microorganism that triggers the immune system or just the genetic material that provides the instruction for making specific proteins and not the whole virus so the whole microbe approach are again of two types one is live attenuated vaccine which uses a living but weakened version of the virus um this is similar to the inactivated vaccine and can be manufactured on large scale then the second one is inactivated 
uh, vaccine or killed vaccine the this is this was the most traditional way the first way to make a vaccine it is non infectious it is made non infectious by uh, adding to it physical or chemical uh, the, uh, compounds uh, it it is inactivated by chemical heat or radiation and are attractive because they present multiple viral proteins for the immune recognition have stable expression of antigenic epitopes and again can be produced in large quantities so uh, viruses grow in large numbers and this technique often requires cells and we will see each vaccine of which cells are used to grow so the next one is the viral vector vaccine this is also an important technique uh, it utilizes genetically engineered virus vector systems for example adenovirus that will carry the gene that encodes for a uh, sars virus two year we are taking covid vaccine or we are taking sars cov2 um, viral target often the surface spike, spike proteins are used here viral vector based vaccines are non infectious they are existing licensed human vaccines which are using the same platform then there are protein based vaccines which consists only of proteins such as uh, viral spike protein which are synthesized and produced via recombinant genetic techniques in the lab in the laboratory a part of the protein is produced alone without the need of the whole infectious growing pathogen to make a recombinant or synthetic protein dna encoding for a region of the virus for example spike is combined with a plasmid that will help the transport the dna instructions for making the viral protein a host cell line is used to rapidly produce this particular protein and this is uh, grown in bulk collected purified combined with an adjuvant to enhance the immune response and then packaged as recombinant vaccine so protein based vaccines are again non infectious they are existing licensed human vaccines using this platform the important one other is dna vaccine also have great therapeutic potential due to the ability to enhance uh, t cell induction and antibody production uh, they have excellent bio compatibility uh, for of liquid dna of plasmid dna sorry uh, low cost of manufacturing and they have a longer shelf life the disadvantage is only the dna molecule must cross the nuclear membrane to be transcribed so dna vaccines are again non infectious and to come to nucleic acid vaccines uh, which are now very famous which have come out as a new technology such as mrna vaccines and again you have in nucleic acid vaccines you have again dna vaccines here which are delivered into human cells where they will be transcribed into viral proteins they use mrna that carries the code for the sars cov2 spike protein these vaccines can be either non replicating mrna construct or self amplifying mrna construct able to directly intracellularly form mrna amplification the mrna is chemically or enzymatically synthesized in the laboratory without the use of cells you don't require cells here and uh, because the nucleic acids or the rna are very fragile you require it to be encapsulated and mostly lipid nanoparticles are used to um, cover it or coat it so that it safely reaches to the cell this technology is new there are no pre existing licensed human vaccines in using this platform but studies and reports now show that um, these vaccines represent a promising uh, future compared to the conventional vaccines due to their high potency uh, ability to ability to rapidly develop or development or manufacturing is quite quick they don't require any cells to grow and they are cost efficient so the examples are the are famous um, uh, pfizer and uh, moderna yeah there is another concept that is coming up very quickly now that is virus like particles which do not uh, this does not have an rna does not have an um, dna nothing these are just the con which is uh, and these are just protein based vaccines uh, which are composed of proteins from the virus uh, viral capsids the particle is self assembled nanostructure incorporating key viral proteins it resembles molecular and morphological features of um, authentic Uh, virus it is non infectious non replicating because they lack the genetic material the vlp or virus like particles stimulate high immune response due to the repetitive structures 
and are safer than several other vaccine platforms. So in, you can see a paper here, a report here in the study, which was uh, published in July, on July 30th, 2020, construction and application of VLP has been shown in vaccinology and virological research. These, the, this paper reports that they optimize sequences of gene coding S, M, E, and N structural proteins of SARS-CoV-2. The four genes were cloned into an expression uh, vector uh, PC, uh, that this is a famous vector that they have used, PC DNA 3.1. And then the transformation experiments were performed with chemically, um, with um, the chemical component cells uh, like E. coli, um, engineered cells called as DH5 alpha. And uh, they were engineered using heat shock method in the water bath at 42 degrees for one hour. And then the plasmid construct were uh, co-transinfected uh, into the human um, embryonic kidney cells, that is HEK293 cell line. And they had, astonishingly, they have used some, uh, Cleverly, they have used two cell lines here and they have made a comparison also. So the one cell line that they have used is human embryonic uh, kidney cell line and the other one is Vero C6 cell line. Now Vero C6 cell line is uh, Vero lineages uh, isolated from kidney epithelial cells of uh, African green monkey. That is why the name Vero is given because it's green monkeys that they have used. So their data demonstrate that SARS-CoV-2 VLPs uh, possess molecular and morphological properties of native virion particles, and such VLPs with has a promising vaccine. It is a promising vaccine candidate, and a, and a powerful tool for the research. So, they show the structural protein expression of the membrane protein also, and plus they have compared the two cell lines, and they say that Vero C6 cells have shown more stable and unified as compared to the HEK. 293 cell lines. Very interesting paper and a good diagrammatic representation also. Now we come to a uh, um, genomic era. So uh, this is the approach used in to identify vaccine candidate and it is called as reverse vaccinology. The basic idea is an entire pathogenic genome that is sequenced and screened by employing bioinformatics method to explore the genes. This is a computational approach which allows prediction of all antigens independent of how many are present and, and how much is the immunogenicity during infection. The virulence of a pathogen is identified using functional genomics like say microarrays or proteomics which are, used, which are highly used nowadays. The first attempt at reverse vaccinology began with meningococcus. The vaccine developed by Novartis identified more vaccine candidates in 18 months uh, than being discovered during the previous 40 years. So this was the clinical approach in, which led into uh, vaccine development. And uh, the figure on the right hand side shows the steps. Uh, it's a schematic figure. It summarizes the pathway of the vaccine development and as it says reverse vaccinology. So let us go from below to the top. The computer analysis of the whole genome identifies the genes coding for predicted antigens and eliminates antigens with homologous with uh, to the human proteins. The second step is they, they identified antigens are screened for expression by the pathogen for immunogenicity during infection. The next step, the third step is the selected antigens are then used to immunize animals and test whether immunization induces a protective response. The fourth step is uh, pr uh, protective antigens are then tested for their presence and uh, con conservation of, um, uh, you can say it's a collection of strains that represent the species. Finally, selected antigens are manufactured in large scale for clinical trials and candidate vaccines are tested for safety and protective immunity in human beings also. And the next step is scientific, clinical, and technical information is analyzed and approved by regulatory agencies like say FDA, Food and Drug Administration, or um, even European uh, Medicinal Agency. It's called as EMA, E-M-A. And the seventh step is policy making bodies such as um, AIEP uh, or even the equivalent bodies of other nations make the recommendation of how the vaccine should be used. And the last step is the approved vaccine is then commercialized and used in large scale. At this point, it also coincides with the uh, phase four clinical studies 
uh, to confirm the safety. So this is called as reverse technology. You go first identify by computation how the vaccine is and how the structures are and then move forward on the top. So this is basically used now. So once again, coming to the structure before we go to the vaccines, it is um, approximately 70 to 90 nanometers in size, having 30 KB. Um, and uh, it's a single standard RNA virus. Uh, it's, uh, the, it is cytoplasmic uh, multiplication is there. And then the coronavirus genomic organization, you can see here uh, on the left-hand side, it is flanked with the uh, un untranslated regions or UTR they are called. They are open reading frames, uh, 1A and 1B, which has non-structural proteins, uh, like main proteases, papain-like protease, dependent RNA polymerase, and endoribonuclease, these four for non-structural uh, structures. And then what is interesting is, uh, from 21,563 to 29,674 kilobase pairs, you see the code of the genome SARS-CoV-2 uh, that encodes the spike proteins. Uh, this is E, M, and N proteins. So the this is what is more interest to the scientist. On the right-hand side, you can see a diagram which shows that the virus has a crown shape with the spikes on the membrane. Uh, which are used to embed in the host membrane derived lipid bio bilayer. And uh, it has two subunits, S1, which contains a receptor binding domain, which is called as RBD, um, which is more studied now, and which is responsible for recognizing and binding with the cell receptor. The S2 the subunit is acts as a stem of the structure, which contains other basic elements needed for membrane fusion. So this is where the, everyone has to target. The spike protein is a common target for neutralizing antibodies and vaccines. And this is this can also infect the respiratory or attach to the respiratory epithelial cells of the human, that is ACE2 receptors. So coming to the first, we start with inactivated first and then go to the recent technology. So this is basic the traditional technology which is used by Covaxin, PBV152. It's a whole virion inactivated virus-based um, COVID vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, India's first indig indigenous vaccine against uh, severe or SARS-CoV-2 uh, being developed by Bharat Biotech in collaboration with ICMR and NIV Pune from where they received the virus seed strain. So Bharat Biotech has received the virus from NIV Pune. This uh, vaccine is developed on Vero cell platform. I have already explained what are Vero cells. They are epithelial cells from green monkeys which have been established a track record of safety and efficacy in country globally. So long, long before Vero cells were found out and the cell line is still being used by all the firms. The firm generated safety and immunogenicity data in various animal species. They are phase one and phase two trial. And their phase three trial came out very recently. The results were out and it showed 81% of efficacy. Now, when we talk of efficacy here, let us be very clear right in the beginning. This is not equivalent to effectiveness. Vaccine efficacy is something which is on clinical trial mode, which checks two groups. One is the control group, which is the placebo arm, and the vaccinated group. The effectiveness is seen in the real world when the vaccine field trials happen in mass scale. That means community immunization. So these two are very different things, and uh, you should often have that in your mind. So talking about Go vaccine. Here you have a diagram which we can read now. Um, basically, it's a diagram, hand hand drawn diagram, and it it will show you how the vaccine is actually produced. As we are going to technology now, so Bharat Biotech used a sample of the coronavirus isolated by India's uh, National Institute of Virology, Pune. The development team isolated a strain SARS-CoV-2 from patients with asymptomatic infection and developed a vaccine on a Vero cell line manufacturing platform to deliver the inactivated virus strain. So let us uh, see the diagram. So here we have the virus used as a seed right in the first uh, on the left hand side, first picture, uh, inoculated in um, Vero cell medium. Viruses infect the cell and grow. So have they, they have a bunch of cells which are separately cultured in an enrichment medium again for continuous development. It becomes like a big factory. Once the cell, large stocks of the coronavirus are produced, 
this is stored at less than 40 degrees Celsius. Then the viruses are harvested out of the cells. Supernatant is collected. These viruses are then doused, literally dipped into a chemical called as beta proteolactin. This is what kills the uh, virus RNA uh, or is replicating gene, you can say. So beta propiolactone, an organic compound of the lactone family, is used for inactivating as an inactivating reagent for in vaccines. So this is a disinfectant used in tissue, graft, surgical instruments, enzymes, sterilants, etc. So the compound disables the coronaviruses by bounding to its uh, bonding to its genes. Inactivation is confirmed by seeing the replication, and then they are filtered with about a 0 0.22. Um, micrometers, uh, cellular components are separated out, the pore size that is, and uh, the cellular components are separated out from the viruses. The researchers then drew off uh, the inactivated virus and mixed them with a tiny amount of aluminum based compound called as adjuvant. And uh, the adjuvant stimulate the immune system to boost its response to a vaccine. So inactivated viruses have been used over a century now, and this is the way how they are prepared. And um, this was done by in polio vaccine by uh, Jonas Salks, the famous uh, Salk and Sabin vaccines that you study every time, which was developed in 1950s. So this is, uh, um, like you can say, it's a platform which is time tested and used. So moving forward, let us see how it prompts the immune response. So the doused coronaviruses, the dead coronaviruses are you have it in the co-vaccine now they can be injected into the skin without causing covid because they are inactivated the vaccine inoculated is inoculated in the deltoid muscle the immune system gets activated the macrophages dendritic cells the neutrophils triggered by the adjuvant the antigen present cell breaks down the corona the coronaviruses apart and displays some of its fragments on its surface. So remember, it's an inactivated vaccine, uh, inactivated virus there, and it is broken down um, by our cells, and they are presented. You, you know how they are presented by um, MHC molecules. The T cells detect the fragment. If the fragment fits into one of the surface proteins, the naive uh, T cell becomes activated. And in the presence of interleukin-4 and the absence of interleukin-2, the naive T cells which can, will get converted into uh, T helper 2 cells, that is CD4 cells, which would then release interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-10, interleukin-13, and then that would cause relevant B cell production. The B cells that are recognized, that uh, has been recognized, uh, are multiplied or they are produced. The B cells have surface proteins in a huge variety of shapes. They get activated, proliferates, and produces antibodies that have the same shape as against the virus spike proteins. So it's polyclonal. Many will have many cells will also become memory cells. So there are plasma cells and memory cells, both here. So as a backup. So the other pathway with would be the naive T cells in the presence of interleukin 12 which is usually released by macrophages and dendritic cells, nucleated cells, you can say, gets converted to T helper 1 cells, that is CD8 cells. This would then release interleukin 2, which connects with the cytotoxic T cells to activate it. And you know the function of cytotoxic T cells. They will um, catch hold of all the cells in the body that are being infected by the viruses. And again, memory also will be formed. So this is basically, to put it in short, how the immune system is being prompted by the viruses or by the vaccine. Coming to the next one is the famous um, Sinopharm vaccine. So this is BB1BP CORV B C O R B. These are this is produced or developed by Beijing Institute of Biological Products and uh, based by uh, Sinopharm's China the National Biotech Group. Uh, so it is uh, Chinese, basically Chinese state-owned biotech company based in Beijing. This virus is made using dead or weakened coronavirus. Uh, and it is that means it is based on inactivated virus. So I'm taking inactivated viruses first because it's uh, easy to link all the, vaccine, all the vaccine candidates together. So last time when we spoke about, we did not find this particular details of this uh, vaccine. 
and i could not include it in my uh, presentation in the last one but then when i typed bb1 bp cor2 then i found this paper in journal cell uh, it is uh, august 6 2020 paper development of an inactivated vi vaccine candidate uh, with potent protection against sars cov2 and it explains the create creation a very good graphical abstract and it says that at the time the sars cov2 outbreak the scientists isolated three sars cov2 strains from bronco alveolar lavage samples or you can say throat swabs of three patients admitted to wuhan hospital a highly efficient proliferation and high genetic stability with the key features for the development of inactivated vaccine they found that 19 n cov co cdc tan hbo2 which is in short called as hbo2 strain showed the most optimal replication and generated highest value yields in vero cells so this was not found in last time when we read so the amplification or the production of the uh, in the production they use vero cells here so they they inoculated all the three strains and you can see the diagram on the left hand side in the paper or you can see it in the next um, the next slide you can see so this they they have made a comparison of on the whole genome sequences of hbo2 strain and other sars cov2 strains from the domestic and international sources and it shows um, it is homologous to the viral strain that is demonstrated and the main protective antigen showed that is the spike protein showed about 100% homology so that is why they selected this strain and this strain was purified grown in monkey kidney cells that is vero cells in a bioreactor tank and they reported the development characterization preclinical evaluation of an inactivated sars uh, species so this is really an interesting paper to read and they they showed all the placebo controlled and all the phase 2 phase uh, phase 1 and 2 trial reports in lancet later on in uh, 2020 december i think so coming to the and the inactivation was again done in propio uh, beta propiolactone that was one thing which is common in the previous vaccine that we had seen co vaccine so this is the Uh, picture i was uh, diagram i was going to show you the viral titers of three strains of different uh, generations and you can see hbo2 showing the highest in um, virus replication and the activity and then there is a flow chart there which shows the preparation this is given in that paper itself and it shows cell recovery the cell factory then the bio basket bioreactor that they have used with the virus seed inoculation then they have inactivation with beta propiolactone and the inactivation checked the replication is checked whether the viruses are not uh, replicating then the virus supernatant is concentrated digestion is done with endonucleus enzyme chromatography is done purified adjuvant is used later on and then there is a formulation there and the vaccine has been produced so vero cells are being used for mass cultivation to inactivate virus production they use beta propiolactone and uh, in the ratio of 1 is to 4000 at 2 to 8 degrees celsius so this is a very beautiful presentation they are given in the paper coming to the next one that is astrazeneca and oxford this is called as chad c h a d o x 1 c h is for chimpanzee a d is for adenovirus o x is for oxford and this is their first version so they called it call it as chad ox 1 cov 19 So this vaccine is developed by Oxford University along with AstraZeneca as a platform for its production. It's a recombinant adenovirus vaccine uh, against SARS-CoV-2. It uses a modified cold virus, non-pathogenic virus found in chimpanzees and it is uh, weakened and it cannot cause illness in people. So this technology uses a chimpanzee adenovirus which delivers the spike proteins genetic material. so use of adenovirus delivery system is not new actually as compared to the lentivirus or the retrovirus this is the best system so to cultivate this adenovirus in large numbers they use fetal cells and the reason why fetal cells are used because fetal cells are pluripotent one cell is capable of dividing into many other kind of cells and this was uh, the issue that was raised i'm showing your two papers here uh this the the issue was the cells are extracted from abortus fe aborted fetus 
So it said that manufacturers of vaccine using such ethically tainted human cell lines, um, they objected for it. And then an explanation was given in the papers by doctors and scientists. So basically, more scientifically oriented to speak, these traditional adenovirus-based vaccines, in fact, require cells to be used as factories. The two fetal cells which are mostly used are the um, HEK, we seen in the last paper, human embryonic kidney cells. And the other one is PERC6, that is human embryonic retinal cells. So these are retinoblasts. So these two cells are being harvested from aborted fetuses, one in 1966 and other in 1971. Since then, they are passaged and they are used for decades now. So uh, one is used, as we say now, HEK is used uh, most most of the vaccine preparations. And PERC6 is used by JNG. We'll see it later slides. So the cultured non uh, human animal uh, cells also can produce the same proteins, but they won't be decorated with the different sugar molecules. Uh, so they would be, sorry, they would be decorated with sugar molecules, which in case of vaccines runs the risk to uh, evoke um, the robust and spe uh, specific immune responses. So that was a question uh, for using animal cells. So they use uh, human cells now. So it makes it much more easier for the vaccine production. So let us see how the Oxford vaccine is produced. It's genetically engineered, so it is called as recombinant vaccine. It is created from a modified adenovirus obtained from chimpanzee. The genetic code of the replication genes of this adenovirus is removed, so it cannot trigger infection in human being, and it is spliced in the genetic sequence from coronavirus for the production of spike proteins. That is what you see as you go on seeing the diagram. This forms the vaccines, and this forms the main vaccine, you can see. The technical term is called as viral vector vaccine. Now, to acquire these in large numbers, they are grown in human cell culture. The adenovirus simply serves as a vehicle to get the genetic sequence into our cells. It is non-replicative. Remember that the replication genes have been removed, and the genetic sequence of the coronavirus is replaced there. So viruses have been designed by millions of, of years of evolution precisely to figure out ways to sneak into the uh, cells. So you require this particular vehicle, you can say. So Oxford AstraZeneca uses cells, HEK293, uh, which has a gene added to allow the viral particles uh, to multiply at enormous rate. So billions and billions are grown in bio factory and bio reactors, like a bio factory. Every RNA has a complementary strand. It's an RNA virus, so it naturally has a complementary strand, uh, strand that can build and convert the RNA into a DNA. The inoculated DNA then enters into the nucleus. Uh, in the nucleus, then the mRNA is formed, and then they are picked up by the ribosomes. The ribosomes will read the genetic material and make more adenoviruses. Uh, then they are, uh, then the HEK cells are killed and uh, they are removed. Uh, the adenovirus with spike proteins are harvested, purified, and then this becomes the vaccine. So they are, they, they have several benefits for using adenovirus, you can say. One is if the adenovirus has relatively a large sized, uh, well characterized genome. The adenovirus are easy to manu manipulate genetically. Uh, their viral replication can be inhibited by genetic modification. So these are the basic things which they see when they select a viral vector to, trans to transfer the genetic material. So these are better than the lentivirus and the retrovirus. The risk of insertion mutagenesis uh, is minimal. And um, the advantages is to induce strong and robust uh, sustain innate and adaptive immune response. So this is basically the, uh, you can say, genetically engineered uh, virus that has been inoculated, that has been used in Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. But the replication gene has been removed. So it is harmless and cannot replicate in our body. Next, coming to the famous JNG, which has just been come up in the market now. This is called as AD, this is also the AD26 that is adenovirus 26 is used here. It is built by Janssen. Janssen is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is, is the viral vector vaccine again. 
to create this vaccine, Johnson and Johnson team took a harmless adenovirus, the viral vector, and replaced a small piece of the genetic instruction with the coronavirus genes of SARS-CoV, just as you see in the previous in the previous slide. They use here they use another platform for growing the adenovirus. They use fetal tissue cells here developed from retinal cells from an 18 week old fetus abortus aborted in 1985. So the PER per C6 cells used here are actually created by a company called as Crucel, C-R-U-C-E-L-L, Crucel company. The retina from the fetus was isolated. And the reason why fetal cells were taken, as I told you, they are pluripotent cells. And uh, JNJ vaccine is built on this particular platform. So they have the adenovirus, which actually carries the genetic material. And this modified adenovirus cannot replicate, cannot cause an infection. And in short, the single shot Janssen's vaccine. So this is the technology that is identical to Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine, as both are using viral vector root. But it is similar to Sinopharm because Sinopharm is also using adenovirus 26. So... Coming to a messenger RNA now, the recent one and the most light technology you can say in a very short time. So this is the mRNA vaccines are some of the first COVID vaccines authorized for use. It was the first one. The basics, let us revise. The flow of genetic information in a cell goes from DNA to RNA to protein. It's one of the many concepts that we know since long. So the microorganism genome is a complete set of genes and genetic instructions needed to make that particular microorganism. These genetic instructions are encoded in the DNA that is stored in the nucleus and nearly every cell in our body has that. But in order for the liver cells to be a liver cell and not a heart cell, the liver cell only follows the set of instructions in the genome related to the liver cell. The way the cell takes these instructions is by using a molecule called RNA. We call it as messenger RNA, mRNA. There are proteins in the cells which, uh, whose job is to go to the nucleus and write down the specific instructions for certain tasks. These instructions or mRNAs are then carried uh, to another part of the cell where they are used to build proteins, the ribosomes. Every protein a cell makes goes through this process. RNA is copied into, uh, DNA is copied into RNA and that mRNA is translated into protein. So mRNA vaccines are just a type of vaccine where mRNA instructions for some of the SARS-CoV proteins are packaged. This mRNA is injected into person's arm. The mRNA is introduced into the cells of the body and SARS-CoV-2 mRNA is treated like mRNA that that our own cells uh, nucleus has, and it is translated in protein. So when mRNA vaccines do is prompt is, what they do promptly is a few of the cells near the injection site uh, produces spike proteins. This then primes our immune system to build the antibodies and the T cells that fight off the coronavirus infection when it comes. So basically what happens is the vaccine tricks our cells into creating these specific proteins, thinking that they are our own. So mRNA, new, new kind of vaccine, it is developed by Moderna and BioNTech, that is uh, Pfizer manufacturing. So let us see, in short, uh, a simple diagram. This is a coronavirus, a part of the gene is selected. You can see the dark color part there. And the virus, the part of this virus is picked up as a target for our immune system to attack. It's an antigen which provokes the antibodies. Only a small subunit of the viral genome, so the vaccine doesn't have instruction to make whole SARS-CoV-2 virus. Instead, it makes just makes the spike proteins. The other things of the genome of the coronavirus are not taken. So the other regions are not selected. The new approach to making vaccines is how this mRNA has to be delivered to the target cell. That is quite a big challenge. So they have used nanoparticle delivery system. So encapsulating the RNA. So you, everyone knows RNA is very fragile. It has a short lifespan. It can disintegrate, degrade. So it has to be encapsulated before you inoculate it into the body. So encapsulating RNA in a package that can travel through the bloodstream and reach the target cells is quite a challenge. One of the heroes of this story is the nanoparticle. RNA or DNA are simply not very great drugs. 
it does not cross the cellular membrane they are larger particles so lipid nanoparticles protect the mrna from enzymatic degradation they facilitate endocytosis and endosomal escape a positive charged lipid nanoparticle favors localization of mrna at the negatively charged cell membrane so this is the theory that is used including subsequent endocytosis into the cytosol so endocytosis is how it gets into the cell for it to be transcribed the mrna escapes from the lipid nanoparticle and the endosome and releases its content the decades of work has been gone into this to into how to create as expression of these constructs to function properly and they use the four basic building blocks you can say and um, they have a helper phospholipid a cholesterol polyethylene glycol and lipids and immune cell so it is the top covering or coating of the mrna which is made up of polyethylene glycol which most of the people are sensitive hypersensitive and has allergic reactions towards this so every nano vaccine manufacturer is focused on figuring out structure of ionobisal uh, lipids the biggest advantage of this approach is uh, at least on paper we can see theoretically its simplicity it just has mrna encoding the genes you want the immune system to respond to and then there is a protective shell to keep it to get it into the cell and uh, it can be trans, uh, translated into proteins to drive the immune response so the simplicity of the vaccine means vaccine companies can start making the vaccine as soon as someone gives them the genetic sequence of the pathogen and the biggest advantage is how quickly you can get started testing a new vaccine so this is very interesting so coming to how the nanoparticles i have got this particular picture and it explains synthesis of nanoparticles uh, efficient delivery of mrna vaccines is the key for the success and translation to the clinic so among potential nano, uh, non viral vectors lipid nanoparticles are particularly promising lipid nanoparticles can be synthesized with relative ease in a scalable manner it protects the mrna against degradation it facilitates the endosomal escape and it reaches to the targeted cell uh, and uh, it, it can be decorated it can be co delivered with the um, adjuvants also so the diagram here shows lipids dissolved on the left hand side top lipid dissolved in ethanol and an aqueous buffer of mrna pumped into uh, two primary inlets of a microfluidic mixture using a syringe pump so this is the herring bone structures which induce uh, transfer of the matter or the flow of the fluid horizontally in the laminar flow that enables rapid mixing of ethanol and the aqueous phase although it is done several times nearly 15 cycles are needed for complete mixing and if you see on the right hand side again there is a immune response which i already explained to you so here in case of mrna copies are loaded in the uh, nanoparticle why because the cells do not take uh, allow the larger molecules to pass through them so you have a lipid covering over it and uh, in order to make their entry into the cell much more easier they are coated with the lipid you can say so when nanoparticles are injected into muscle cells lipid nanoparticles will fuse with the cells and um, with the cell membrane and the contents will be released that is mrna into the cytoplasm the ribosomes will pick up it does not go into the nucleus the picture shows here it does not go at all into the nucleus the ribosomes will pick them up because they are already uh, having that mrna there so it will be taken up by the um, ribosomes and the genetic instructions will be read to make the proteins that is the spike proteins in the cytoplasm these when formed will be taken up by the proteasomes and yes, you know proteasomes are sorting machineries they sort it out they degrade it they break it and its part is loaded on the mhc that is major histo -com compatibility complex molecules their function the function of these molecules are, is to um, display the peptide fragment, fragments of proteins within the cells to the t cells so the mhc1 presentation of the antigen can be done by all nucleated cells the peptides are transported into cytoplasmic reticulum loaded onto mhc class 1 molecules and uh, this complex is displayed to the cells to cd8 t cells that is the cytotoxic t cells the this particular uh, t cells will then then 
identify the cells which are infected with the viruses and take care of it. So the, the, this is one thing. The other one is the MHC2 complex, which is displayed on the surface by CD4 cells. They will activate the naive uh, T helper cells, become plasma cells and the memory cells as a backup. This is called training of the immune, immune system. The immune system is primed and ready to defend as the virus enters our body and when we are or when we are infected. We come to the next interesting technology, which I often say that it is the most beautiful technology, a very new technology called, produced by Novavax. So this is a protein-based vaccine candidate engineered from the genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2. It uses a custom-made spike protein that mimics, this is very important, that mimics the natural spike protein. So it is not actually the spike protein, it mimics the spike protein. It is created using Novax recombinant nanoparticle technology. That is what they say on their uh, website. Their website is really great and shows all the technology in details. This generates the antigen derived from the coronavirus spike protein. It is adjuvanted, that is an adjuvant is added, which is the Novavax patented saponin based matrix M to enhance the immune response and stimulate high levels of neutralizing antibodies. The vaccine contains purified protein antigen and can neither replicate nor it can cause COVID-19. This is the technology which we'll go into now. This is, a, as I say, always it's a fasc fascinating technology. The genetic code of the, you can see the whole bar there, uh, genome, se genome sequence of the virus. The whole bar here is the instructions or to make proteins. The little dark green plot, which starts with 21,563 uh, kilo base pairs to 25,384 kilo base pairs is the selective one. It's selected for genetic sequence to encode vaccine antigen. So this small part from the coronavirus is cloned into a virus called, another virus called baculovirus. This is again a non-pathogenic virus and it is cloned in that. And one important thing here is the DNA is used and not RNA. So the uh, coronavirus has um, RNA. These are RNA-based viruses. It always comes with a complementary DNA. This complementary DNA is then converted to a DNA. And then this DNA is cloned with the VV DNA. This is the recombinant technology part of this particular vaccine. Right? Once more, I'll repeat. The, RNA, the coronavirus is an RNA virus. It always comes with a complementary DNA. The complementary DNA is converted to a DNA. The, this DNA is cloned with baculavirus uh, DNA. And this is the recombinant technology part. Now to grow these VV, the cells from the moth, these are fall army worm moth. These are used or butterfly or larva, you can say. They are taken. These cells are SF9 cells. So remember, all this is done in the laboratory. So these are SF9 cells. Then the moth cells, SF9, are infected with the modified BB. This is Bacula virus. This, this becomes the famous SF9 oblique BV cell lines of Novavax. The DNA is released. The DNA enters the nucleus of the butterfly cells where the spike protein genome is transcribed into mRNA. Comes out of the nucleus, the mRNA is ready, is read or it goes to the ribosome and the ribosome will then make up the proteins. In short, the virus is injected into butterfly cells which will make spike proteins. In AstraZeneca and other companies, you have seen that we were going to make the spike proteins. Here the butterfly moth makes, they are actually called as hired cells to do this job. So now these spike proteins are extracted from the moth cells and you get all the spike proteins, uh, like, you know, sp separate uh, spikes, uh, spikes uh, as you see there. And then these are brought together or assembled together to make, uh, to convert it into a molecule. And here they use nanoparticle. So nanoparticle has, uh, it is not encapsulated, it is, like embedded into the nanoparticle. So nanoparticle that has spike proteins on it, not inside it, on it. So it becomes a surface uh, immunogenic nanoparticle. In AstraZeneca and other companies, uh, it was not immunogenic. So this is an immunogenic, your part. The nanoparticle itself is immunogenic because through it, you can see 
uh, as you can see in the diagram through it just like actual coronavirus uh, the spike proteins have be, are coming out or they are uh, peeping out of it and uh, this this is the spike protein that you see and this is the nanoparticle technology that's why they call it as recombinant nanoparticle technology so this is the immunogenic part and uh, can this bind to the ace 2 you will ask me the question now because it is immunogenic can it bind no it cannot bind because it doesn't have enzymes it is just a mimic or it is just a replica of it it's just a particle with spikes on it so it mimics the virus it does not have mrna it does not have dna it does not have the adenovirus nothing in it it is just a spike protein uh, embedded into or assembled into nanoparticles so the recombinant nanoparticle technology it also has an adjuvant which boosts the immune response to see it from their website apart from the diagram that is shown that is showing here to see it from their technological point of view you can see a beautiful diagram here now uh, this is the novavax vaccine or the vaccine which has no mrna no lipid nanoparticle no dna and uh, these vaccines which are they, they do not have adeno based vaccine these are not the, those and uh, they just have a type of um, what you can see even a immunogenic particle uh, picked up by the these are picked up by the ribosomes directly and uh, because they as soon as they enter into the body they need not go into the cell as soon as they are injected and into the body they become foreign and immune cells get activated and the macrophages and dendritic cells pick them up and then the, these cells are uh, produce immune response so what you can see is a, a good diagram the bacula virus delivers the uh, coronavirus spike protein and then the rna the dna to fall uh, army virus army worm moth cells the second stage is the moth cell um, uh, produces spike proteins the spike proteins are collected they are studied yeah that's a very beautiful word they are studied in the synthetic particle and uh, then the uh, saponin that is purified plant conjugate compound is added to boost the immune response the vaccination the fifth the last point the vaccination aims to trigger production of anti spike antibodies um, blocking the sars cov 2 infection so that's a good diagram so the spike proteins are literally assembled together to form a nanoparticle they are not coated with the nano lipid nanoparticle okay so this is again how the immune response takes place so there are there is a virus which has spike antigens all over its surface immune cells prefer to bind and engulf the nanoparticles rather than the soluble proteins and on the left hand side you can see that is from the website of novavax it is showing that the nanoparticles are assembled together not covered and there is an adjuvant which is used on the right hand side you can see on the top it appears to be using a they they it, they use like uh, they have not specified what they are using as a nanoparticle but they had a they are having a previous um, vaccine which is in trials now which is against the influenza and it is um, it has hemagglutinin in nanoparticle approach and it has spike ferritin nanoparticle so in this uh, we don't know what they are using as nanoparticle so that was their technology in 2016 which they have already developed so this technology is not new it's the other vaccines are already like flu vaccine are already into uh, the clinical trials so once the vaccine is injected into muscle cells now in case of ovax the muscle cells will not pick them up uh, but the immune system will uh, recognize them as foreign so the difference is that this is the difference in nanoparticle technology in pfizer and moderna which use nanoparticles as delivery systems they are non immunogenic and they have to enter the cells and release the mrna in the cell and to make spike proteins here what happens is the particle has spike proteins on it so the immune system will directly interact like dendritic cells or others the picture down below shows uh, a dendritic cell which many arms to it and uh, macrophages neutrophils nk cells and uh, they will present it, it to msc complex and then the same thing will follow as i explained last time if interleukin 4 is present and interleukin 12 is absent the naive t cells will have uh, t helper 2 cells in inactivated so they will get converted into b cells and plasma cells and similarly the other thing if in interleukin 12 is present then the naive t cells will become helper t1 cells and they will release interleukin 
one entity into and they will become cytotoxic which, which the which will take care of the infected cells in our body so this is how it the vaccine works so coming to the key takeaways conventional vaccine vaccinology has often proved to be inadequate in the development of vaccines uh, for the pathogens that are antigen diverse uh, those that cannot be cultivated in the laboratory those that lack um, uh, suitable animal models of infection and those that are controlled by mucosal uh, t cell dependent immune response so it becomes very hard for vaccines to be formed if the pathogens is uh, this antigenically diverse so the coronavirus vaccines here gets a biotech boost it's about as far as science gets a miracle as i told you last time a totally unprecedented accomplishment of something that would normally have taken years that actually was accomplished in months and the world realizes it this work was really extraordinary the three separate platforms that were pursued were mrna adenovirus in human and chimpanzees as well as the recombinant protein and the results nothing short of spectacular the speed at which the structure based vaccine design or mrna vaccine can be designed could make it vital in to pandemic responses just two months after identifying the coronavirus sequence the first mrna vaccine was designed and entered into human trials the application of genomic analysis to vaccine development a term that we seen just now reverse vaccinology and other biotechnologies make it possible to improve to further improve the quality of the vaccine and expand the clinical applications of vaccines significantly so if the question is asked if you get the choice which covid vaccine should you choose i would say for now the best vaccine is one which is about to go into your arm that is it thank you thank you very much ma'am if anyone has any questions please feel free to ask or you can type in chat box can i ask uh, one question ma'am yeah yes sir was, yes sir it was it was indeed a great talk you covered almost everything that is at Thank present you. available to humanity and Thank i mean you. it's a great effort uh, uh, ma'am i was just uh, uh, curious to know the last uh, technology that you showed yeah uh, that, yeah the m protein is used mm -hmm. as an adjuvant yes so, matrix so, protein yeah can you elaborate on that i mean this is something new actually they haven't showed but i do have uh, one or two slides here um, i thought if, if it is a uh, time is not a uh, proper then i would not say it so this is uh, this is on their website they have shown on the left hand side you can see a nanoparticle which is having which is uh, produced by, uh, virus like nanoparticle produced in vaccine for 2016 and in 2016 and this has a spike ferritin nanoparticle so this is one that they have shown and this is uh, not the one which is shown for mrna just now that they are using or for the other vaccines but this is the novavax vaccine which has an agglutinin nanoparticle approach which is for 2016 this is one on their website and the left hand diagram shows how they are assembled then i have one more year which is this is the matrix one which you are yeah yeah correct so this uh, this uh, they haven't this is actually their own uh, patented uh, matrix m adjuvant and uh, it is not mentioned what it is but they they have in the former vaccines they have used saponin with cholesterol phospholipid formulated generated strong immune response that is that clinical trials which has shown and this is the nano flu vaccine which contains similar parts just like the parts of coronavirus so they have the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase so these are the spikes that are present on influenza virus so virus yeah yeah so that they have used here uh, for to tar as a target and the the platform is the same matrix m adjuvant so mm -hmm. based on this if we can conclude that If they are using the same we don't know but uh, the formulation they won't tell so this yeah this is this is in trials now uh, nano flu uh, nano flu it is called and it shows good safety profile for influenza and uh, also good uh, work well works well in older adults as they say and uh, good response in animal so it is nearly in the phase 3 now trial phase 3 
Thank yeah. you so much, ma'am, once again. Thank you. Ma'am, welcome. Ma'am, can I ask a question about uh, studying in Canada? Studying in Canada. Can I ask a question about this? Uh, Rohan, I think uh, you have to answer. Otherwise, it is out of the market and in interest. And I think. No, you can have okay. my uh, yeah. You can have my email ID. Uh, we can talk uh, one to one. one, to one. Okay, ma'am. Uh, can you write your email ID in chat box? Okay, it is. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So it's on the first slide, or uh, you can take it from Deshmukh sir, or. Uh, I I will provide him. I will yeah. provide. Him. Okay. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I must say it was one of the best lectures I ever had in terms of information in presented in simplified manner. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. You're most welcome. Most welcome. Yeah, uh, ma'am, I had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah ma'am, you have told very nicely about promising vaccine candidates and yeah. also mentioned yeah. about reverse vaccinology and a very prompt answer just now you have told about matrix protein also. So yeah. my yeah. small question was, uh, why to prefer these cell lines like H E cell line uh, to ninety three or uh, Vero C six cell line? Yeah, because you yeah, want because you want the adenovirus to grow in large numbers. You want bio factories, isn't it? So you you require viruses grow only on cells. They don't have a synthetic media. They cannot grow like bacteria on synthetic media. So they require live cells. So you have to give them live cells. So animal cells were used like monkey cells or virus cells. These these were used formerly, but now they use human cell because uh, it brings in the it boosts the virus. You can say the vaccine production, and uh, most of the sugar moieties which are present are eliminated. Um, if they use animal cells, then they they are again having some problems there. So they use human cells now. And since 1966 or say you can say 1970, they have been using human cells. See the basic technique is even if you are using adenovirus or lentivirus or retrovirus as an delivery mode or a delivery vector, viral vector, but still to grow in large amount, manufacturing in large amount. Just think of a factory, uh, an industry. You are setting up an industry now, and you require so many adenoviruses with that particular spike protein genome in it. And you want all these adenoviruses to be produced and given on mass scale, sold on a mass scale commercially. So you require something to grow adenovirus, and that's why these cells are used. These cells are later they are removed off, they are cleaned, they are purified, and only the adenoviruses are picked up, and then that becomes a vaccine. Okay, I think we can end now. Any more questions? If you want, you can just ask me personally. Also, my email ID was there on the first slide, and um, phone number also, WhatsApp also. So anyone can contact. Sure, 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 ma'am. And sir is Deshmukh sir is there always to help the students. So we are there. So you can just ask any questions. So my next uh, third uh, talk of this series will be uh, on other techniques which are used in the industries apart from the vaccines. These two lectures are I have taken as a vaccine because this was the most recent topic and advanced studies going on. So the next one will be all other techniques which are used in the industries. I'll try to cover up one or two industries which are using fascinating technologies, um, and uh, we can finish. We can do that, or we can study all those. Techniques and you can just touch upon it in one lecture. Yeah. Ma'am, there are questions in chat box. Also. Pardon? There are questions in chat box also. Okay. Whoever is asking, what will be the difference between Novavax vaccine and natural novel cow to virus? Difference between Novavax and Novavax vaccine and natural COVID virus, COV two. Yeah, COV two 
see the virus the novavax doesn't have a virus at all it's virus like particle it's a virus mimetic polymer uh, polymer nanoparticle that is used it's not virus at all that is a main difference between both Absolutely. if you understand it yeah if you understand it properly they don't use the virus at all they have just taken the spike proteins which is grown in in different cells moth cells and they have uh, in the moth cells infected with bacula virus 